Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, four-time Grammy Award-winning drummer, Danny Gottlieb. And now, Rich Redman. What is up, everyone? Rich Redman here. This is the Rich Redman Show, coming to you from beautiful Music City, USA, Crash Studio. Of course, my co-host, my sidekick, my mentor, my producer, Jim mentor. McCarthy, jimmccarthyvoiceovers.com, and so excited to have our guest today, Mr. Danny Gottlieb. Great oh, my world-class drummer, world-renowned, household name in the world of drumming. Uh, we're enjoying some coffee here. This yep, is, I think, yep, the first yep. cup of coffee on the Rich Redmond Show. Out of the uh, Rich Redmond coffee cups. These are awesome. These are Look happening, nice. man. Yeah. Cheers, guys. Watch, we can, watch the oh, laptop. I can't do it. Oh, oh, oh. We can Sorry, cheers guys. coffee, right? Thank you for <laughs> inviting me to the show. Mm. You're so more than welcome. This is only my eighth cup. Oh, my God. I spilled a little bit right here. No big deal. It's not It's not real wood. <laughs> We've had some great guests on the show, and guys, thank you so much for liking, commenting, rating, reviewing, subscribing. When you take that one minute to rate the show, to review the show, it lists us higher in the ranks of podcasts, and we want to be found. And, and doesn't you, everybody want that? We want to be found because we want to we want to entertain you, we want to educate you. Of course, the low-hanging fruit is all my drummer friends. We're going to have so many great drummer friends, so many musicians, but we're interviewing comedians, authors, actors, thought oh, leaders, yeah, local influencers, and we're going to be doing remote shows from Los Angeles. So we're just getting started here. So guys, we really, really appreciate the support. Um, but Dan, when did you, when did you move to Nashville? Because you're a New Yorker born and bred, right? Yeah, it's, uh, well, it's been an interesting path. We've been here about seven years This now. is you and your this wife, my Beth. My wife, Beth. Who's, who's also uh, a drummer percussionist. Drummer percussionist, and uh, we both, we moved here uh, seven years ago. Uh, she has family here. Her mm -hmm. parents have been living here, her sister and sister's husband. And um, it, it seemed like a really good place to go, but the ultimate reason was because of family. We wanted to be close to, to her family. Everybody's getting older, and, mm -hmm. and, this, and, and the fact that it's a great music town and a beautiful, wonderful place to live was icing on the cake. That, so that worked out great, and that, that is a thing that happens as, as we get older. You know, our parents take care of us every step of the way, and you know, right. I had super supportive parents that were like, yeah, we'll get you drum lessons in 1976, <laughs> and here's your Blue Sparkle snare drum and your Ted Reed book, and then putting up with the noise all those years, and then my dad driving orchestral chimes and marimbas and timpani we, around. Beth and I both had that with our parents, right? driving that stuff around. Ugh. And look how it turned out. Yeah. I mean, what a career. Okay. You know, you've had, you know, for the people that aren't in the know, you graduated from the University of Miami, right? right? Mm -hmm. Which is a world-class, Steve Rucker's there. Yes, yes. Now, were you guys colleagues at the time? or He's after me. I graduated in 1975. It's a long time ago. Right. Um, there was a, dr a jazz drummer who has since passed away who was a big influence on a lot of people named Steve Bagby. Mm, yes. And he was the, one of the teachers that was at school. So he Incredible. was... Uh, yeah, he used to play a lot with a, a group called the Baker's Dozen, and Jocko, who was a youngster at the time, would also play with that band. Yeah. So we'd kind of follow them all around. And so he was the first influence in terms of a teacher uh, at school. But I grew up in New Jersey, and, and we've talked about this before, but I was so lucky when I was 15. I started late. I started at age 15. Wow. You, when you were talking about you, you know your parents and supportive and the snare drum, I started as a cello player. Well, my, my mom played the violin. I went to get a violin in fourth grade. They didn't have one, so they gave me a cello. And I could fake it really well, but I was awful. Yeah, <laughs> I wasn't a good cello player. Well, you learned about you learned about music theory and note lengths and. Well, you know what it was? It was a touch about a string instrument, mm -hmm. and of all things. So I'm 15, and there's a music store down the street in New Jersey, Dorn and Kirshner, which mostly did band instruments. And I walk in there one day, and there's this guy walking up the stairs, and the and uh, uh, and the person who was the head of the drum department there said, that's Joe Morello. And I went, who? Joe Morello? I, I, I think I know that who that is. And he had a Ludwig catalog, and I knew he was famous, but I didn't quite know who who he was. But I figured, man, this guy must be amazing. Yeah. And I vaguely knew Dave Brubeck somewhere in there, but I, a week later, went and asked if I could take lessons, and Joe said, you know, come up, I'll give you an evaluation. And that started a 40-year 
process of studying and just hanging out with Joe Morello. That's incredible to think about having a teacher and mentor for 40 years. Yeah, and That's right wonderful. when I was starting. So, you know, and, and then when I told my parents I wanted to play the drums, it wasn't even an issue. I just, there was a summer music school program in New Jersey. Um, our first teacher, who unfortunately since passed away recently, Mr. Geist, allowed me to switch from uh, the cello to drums. <laughs> I could do it. I could just do it somehow. Right. And there was a... Uh, another gentleman who was it was a kid at the time named Dave Urig, who was a couple years older than me, uh, who was the drummer in the middle school, junior high school band. And he saw me staring at him and he said, come here, I'll show you how to work. And he showed me how the drums yeah. worked. Years later, when I, um, uh, Dave ended up in Florida and for a long time was the top drummer at Disney World. And he introduced me to Beth inadvertently along with Jim Catalano from Ludwig so he also was responsible for uh, me meeting Beth and wow. starting me on the drums and how long have you and been Beth, Beth been together 21 years and she's a percussionist wow. and you guys play together in the Gary Sinise band and, right and the Lieutenant Dan band yeah, yeah. That, it's the greatest thing I mean you know relationships as we all know can be very very tough when you're a traveling musician and the way I ended up solving it kind of later in the game was to meet somebody who I could play music with. And then we end up getting a gig together. That's incredible. Which wor has worked out not, you know, you know personally, just because we can be together and enjoy the road. It takes that stress of you're going away and all that stuff. But we actually play really well together. Mm -hmm. And I miss her terribly as a... As a you know, with the drum set, there are certain colors that are there. But when you have percussion and you play so much those extra sounds are just missing all the time. I don't I don't like to do a gig unless she's on it. The Rich Redmond show will be right back. Learn by doing, I definitely think resonates with what we're about here at the School of Rock. I'm Angie McCright and I'm the owner of the School of Rock in Franklin and Nashville. I would say that the majority of kids that come in have either been sitting in their bedrooms watching YouTube, learning how to play, or they've taken music lessons at some point in their life. We do have a lot of beginners. It doesn't matter what level you're at. You can participate in our programs, whether you're a beginner or you're advanced. We don't teach music to put on shows. We put on shows to teach music. Connect with School of Rock today. Search School of Rock Franklin or Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. I'm looking at a line here. I could have sworn I saw some videos last night of, um, oh, here's, here's, I'll crank this up. This is a video I found of you and Beth locking down <laughs> some Michael Jackson music. So you've been doing this gig since 2004, right? Yeah. This that's is a great gig. The craziest gig. I, I mean, I love... Hey, are you talking Oops, about that's you? an ad. We don't want that. We're just going to drop the volume for the ad, pesky okay. YouTube. See what you can find there. Yeah, it's it's been really something. Where in New Jersey? Uh, uh, well, I grew up in Union and then ended up... My mom lived in Springfield, so that's where I ended up staying. Is but that I, mid north? Yeah, near. It's like about fifteen minutes from Newark Airport. Okay. Okay. Now Hoboken, I had the ultimate bagel and I had the ultimate <laughs> slice of pizza. I think if I lived in Hoboken, I would be super pudgy and doughy, man. It would be like a carb overload man and every thanksgiving we had to go down to my uncle's house in uh, new brunswick oh not far away from yeah. where i grew up oh yeah jim is a canisian uh, yeah uh. I'm, yeah, I'm from Milford, Connecticut. I'm a, a tri-station. from Connecticut? Yeah. I didn't I'm know originally so from, a, uh, I was Milford. raised in Milford, Connecticut, born in Norwich, Connecticut, yeah, which is, sure. our claim to fame is the original Subway sandwich shop was down on our little, mm. you know how all those, all those quaint little New England towns have the little uh, town square, literally, yeah. the one way. You drive in a it's like circle. downtown Franklin. Yeah, downtown right, Franklin. Right. Check this out. This is um, uh, this is Danny and Beth playing some Michael Jackson music together. Got cowbell? <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> we just did a gig recently where uh, Scotty Brown, a, a drum corps friend of Beth's, Beth used to play in spirit. Oh, she's got amazing a, hands. Yeah, yeah, she he came to a gig and uh, he held up a sign, more cowbell, Beth, or you know, it was oh, it's just funny. great. It's just great to hear that being played like. Yeah. by real musicians because nowadays a cover band would load up some sort of a file onto their iPod with right. tr with with cowbell and percussion tracks. I think that was Paulino da Costa originally. Yeah. Oh my god. And then um John Robinson. Yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. Who's ridiculous. I mean, this guy. You know. But I mean, just looking back at your career for the, so, you know, speaking of your teachers, look at some of these other teachers. Mel Lewis. Mm -hmm. Of course, Joe Morello 40 years 
a teacher that we share who changed my life, Ed Sof. Yes. Um, Gary Chester, who wrote that great book, The New Breed, Jack which, DeJanette, which Harold I, Jones. Yep, yep, and, yep. and tell us about the book with Harold Jones. Well, I mean, my thing, I, I love to study. I'm, I'm really, I mean, I ended up with a teaching gig, but I'm actually really just a student all the time. And one of the things that I like to do is just pick, you know, people's brains and find out what they really want to do. And it turned out in the early... When was this? It must have been the early 80s. Rick Mattingly, who was a, a great writer, a great drummer. And Modern in, Drummer magazine. Yeah. yeah. He, they, Modern Drummer was just starting a book division, and yeah. they were looking for things that they could put in the, the book division. So Joe Morello mm -hmm. was working on Master Studies 1, and Love it was it. all written. In fact, Steve Foster, a, a student of Joe's who was with him longer than I, had actually done a lot of the work, and it was pretty much ready to go. But I was helpful. I was helping Joe a little bit. With, as a liaison with Rick Mattingly with that first book. Yeah. And then uh, the way I met Gary Chester, I uh, early 80s, I was in New York. I heard that there was a band called French Toast, which is a French horn player, and Dave Weckl was playing <laughs> Dave Weckl was the drummer, right? Yeah. yeah. This is before Chick Corea, and he's playing this ridiculous independent stuff on the bass drum. I, I just, my, I was floored. Mm. You know, we all know how, you know, amazing Dave Weckl. And know, Dave was a student of Gary's, yeah. right? And, yeah, and I said, how, would, how are you doing this? He said, well, I've been studying with Gary. You should take a check him out so the next day I called Gary and he lived about an hour north of New York and he uh, for those of you who may not know Gary Chester you may know him from the book but he was a prolific studio musician played on a thousand recordings you know up on the roof under the boardwalk you know the way to San Jose yeah, you know, uh, all the Gene Pitney. Yeah, Bobby check Rondo. out his discography, it's ridiculous. guys. Ridiculous. Yeah, if you buy that book, The New Breed, yeah. if you're a serious drum student, mm -hmm. that along with with syncopation, stick control, master studies, right. the Jim Chapin book, um, that has to be in your in your library. And this, his discography is in the back. And now right. there's no excuse. You you kids can like you crazy kids can get your <laughs> Spotify playlist together, and for ten dollars a month, you can have the entire Gary Chester discography. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And when I went to Gary, he hadn't written a book yet. He had a, these systems written out. And it was very intimidating to be around Gary. I loved him. He was another one who's like a father figure. But as his daughter would describe, when you'd leave a lesson, you'd never know if you sounded good or, or if you were awful. Because it was kind of a mixed message. You know, he heard me on some Pat Metheny albums. Oh, yeah. You know, he had, when I, because I heard that was, that was already finished by that point. And the first thing he said is, Gottlieb, we've got a lot of work to do. <laughs> so so here you are with one of the major jazz award winning recording musicians of all time. Because I'm looking at your play I'm looking at your discography, your 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 pedigree here, and it's like you played on over four hundred albums, mm -hmm. fourteen Grammy nods, and four wins. Yeah. You're a Grammy Award winning jazz musician. How many people can say that? That's a yeah, nice icebreaker at the Starbucks. Very fortunate and lucky. <laughs> you may have heard of me. I Pat Metheny, hello. And they, and they go, "What's jazz?" No, no, Pat, yeah. Pat, <laughs> Pat Metheny. You were with him from from seventy seven to eighty three. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that's where I always talk about in my concept for success crash yeah. relationship is the second word yeah. you met mark egan yeah we were all students at school at, together at Matheny that time and and pat went to university of miami pat was another student and mark was also and we played together we met in 72 so it was from from that i love point it. I, I always say to myself that i'm a, a a child of the 70s in the sense that i was born in 70 mm -hmm. but all the music i really really celebrate i think one of the greatest times in music history is 1969 to 1981 yep and it's like it's like we survived disco, but all those great one-hit wonders and singer-songwriters, you know, your your Rupert Hines and your, the, you know, Bread and, and yes. Air Supply. And, and then you had all the great, you know, the Beatles, the Who, the Rolling Stones, the Zeppelin. You had all the the bands. Yeah. And then, you know, you could play jazz and you could make a living and people bought records and... I mean, I was born, I felt like if I, I wanted to be a teenager during that time. You know, <laughs> yeah. because when I was a teenager, we were listening to Kajagoogoo and New Wave, Aha, and then Heavy Metal hit. Right. You know. You know, I caught that though, because I, you know, I discovered Hal Blaine very early mm -hmm. by chance. When I was sixteen, I went to visit. I had I have had relatives out in California, and I went. What? This is going to sound insane, but this really happened. My cousin. Um, who was living in Los Angeles, and I just for fun went walking around, and we passed uh, Sunset Sound, I think it was called. Oh, Sunset. yeah. It's right on Sunset. Yeah, and mm -hmm. we walked in, and we met an assistant engineer who was just wrapping up a session, 
And he said, what do you do? I said, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a kid. I'm starting to play drums. He said, you ever hear of Hal Blaine? And I went, no. And he said, well, he was just here. And he has a drum set with a million tom-toms. In fact, we just did Spanky and Our Gang. You want to hear some of it? Oh, my and God. And he had the multi-track up, and he played it for us. What a great time in the so music industry. I, Hal Blaine, there it was. You can't get in Sunset Sound <laughs> Does that now. ever happen anymore? You can't walk into a studio I anymore. Mean, without, there's, there you got it's the receptionist. Different. She's like, hello, can I help you? There's nobody there. Now, so, <laughs> yeah. there's, there's nobody in the recording studio. Now, Sunset Sound is hanging on. You know, it that's, wasn't where, them, but that's where they recorded the first um, Van Halen record, all really? the Sheryl Crow records, wow. all tons of major rock records. So I recorded uh, my one bucket list. I recorded there two Decembers ago. Yeah. So I'm trying to get that. No I wanna, kidding. I want to do East West. I want to do Capital. You know, they're all disappearing. Oh, that's you know, great. But, that's great. You got to do that. But, yeah. but uh, what was a big feather in your cap when you got here to play in studio wise? Um, you know, well, here we have, you know, we have Soundcheck, we have Ocean um, Way, we have right? Ocean Way, we have the Warner Brothers Studio, we have uh, Sound Emporium, we have the Backstage. So most of the major studios, Omni gets a lot of work. So I probably have like maybe six, you know, commercial station west. That, yeah, but um, I mean, you know, when you got here, what was the studio that was like, wow, I just recorded there? I don't know if we... If huh? we well, because we have ours, we have the RCA Studio B thing, you know, the Kwanzaa yeah. Hut and all that stuff over there. That's pretty epic because, and you know, um, Black River Entertainment, they used to call it Ronnie's Place. And if anybody's ever checked out my education system, Drumming in the Modern World, I recorded it and filmed it at um, at Backstage. It's, they called it Ronnie's Place. But Elvis recorded there. Oh. Uh, Patsy Klein recorded there. Johnny Cash recorded there. So we have a lot of history here in Nashville. It's pretty epic. Yeah, you know, um, fun, 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 fun stuff. So look, so look at this other stuff. Um, you you start after you met Mark Egan. You started a group called Elements, which was right. more fusiony, right? Yep. And that was that was after Matheny because we played in Pat's group. Mark was gone a little before I was, mm -hmm. and. We used to go, it, it, that generated from trips to Hawaii. We used to go to Japan a lot. When mm -hmm. the dollar was strong, they'd give you business class tickets and we'd change it and go stop in Hawaii. And we had a lot of friends there. We'd play music. And we used to just kind of, we had a friend, our friend Gina, who had a house on the beach. So we would just play music all night with the ocean outside the window. Beautiful. So that was the beginning of Elements. And then uh, Mark I'm and I. I'm getting scenes there. from Moana in my head. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but it was fun. You know, one thing I wanted to mention back about the Gary Chester thing. Yeah, yeah. I, Gary didn't have a book. And he said, I said, do you want to write a book? He said, nah, I can't write a book. I, I, I. So I sat with him. <laughs> he sounds crusty. <laughs> he, he, well, he, he, I mean, he looked like Charles Bronson and he had a <clears throat> gruff voice, but he was the most loving, stern. Yeah. But, you know, and it's funny. And his lessons were so crazy. Anybody, he, first, when I met him, he had 80, 80, 80 students a week. That's a, that's heavy. It was one after another. Half an hour? Uh, no, they were hours. That's 80 oh hours gosh. a week? He must, he must have it really was, loved it. It was all day, you know, late into the night, starting in the morning, and you could get there and watch somebody else's lesson. So there was always people stacked up, hanging out. So there was a community that people... And, and you had to play your lesson with other people around. Wow. Which was really interesting. Now, well, was he... Um, <laughs> was he expensive? How does, I, was, I was about no. to ask. Yeah, a guy no. like that who's played on hundreds of recordings. No, I you know I don't even remember. And I remember this was early '80s. I mean, Joe Morello was fifty dollars, and Gary was maybe sixty or fifty. It wasn't uh, wasn't hundreds. It was right. affordable, and he was he really wanted it. Both of them really wanted to help you. It they were committed about, to education. Yeah, 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 it was all that. And they taught at their house, right? So their uh, wife can be like, "Supper's on." Yeah, well, the, <laughs> great the, time. Gary had a horse in the backyard. He had to go feed, deal with the horse. There was dogs. He had kids running around. Oh it my was, God, Gary did look like Charles Bronson. For yes. those for those young millennial <laughs> listeners, this is a it was an actor from the '70s, and he had a series oh, of I'm movies yeah, right. called Death. Death Wish. Death Wish. And if you <laughs> listen to these soundtracks, what I loved about these soundtracks, there was tons of waka waka guitar, mm -hmm. and there was all on the congas, mm, yeah. and mm -hmm. then the flexitone, and then <laughs> the vibra slap wore that thing out. That's a yep, cool yep, instrument, yep. though. Yeah, oh, it's, it's great. And, you know, with Gary, again, with this book thing, Rick Mattingly wanted him to do one, so I said, let me help you with a book. 
So I sat with Gary after a lesson with a cassette player, and I s- just wrote out what I thought should be in a book. What do you, you know? I asked him, "What do you want to do?" And what about this? And his whole thing was he you would do things with both limbs. He was kind of the precursor of right hand lead, left hand lead, which I'm not great at. Oh, but, horrible left hand lead. That was his thing, and he also wanted you to have all the limbs going with one limb sight reading. And you had to sing while you were The quarter playing. note. Yeah, sing the quarter note, and then another time sing the bass drum, sing the sight reading. Yeah, that's a good. Sing the hi-hat, you know, really pick the limbs apart. Mm-hmm. So I recorded him, and I had a trip to Japan and stopped in Hawaii, and I laid on the beach with headphones in an old cassette player and wrote the stuff out, gave it to Rick Mattingly, and that was the new breed. Nice. So, fa- uh, you know, uh, fast forward 20 years, Beth and I are living in Orlando, and I'm dealing with the washing machine broken and I find a box of cassettes above the thing and there it says Gary Chester and I go Gary Chester what is even I don't even remember it wow. and it's him talking now did you he, digitize him yeah we digitize him and now you get when you buy the book you get it as a download that's fantastic of the interview with me with a cold like down like this talking you know and it's just you know me asking not f- really for release but it's Gary talking and Katrina Gary's daughter we gave her the you know she's on there also talking about her dad and she, it blew her mind to hear her dad 20 years later he died shortly after the book came out book came out early 80s he died 85 86 oh and how old was he early 60s late 50s oh no not, wow yeah, not, late not 50s young. yeah not maybe early 60s he yeah. was a you know smoker and I don't, I don't know if that contributed <clears throat> to it but yeah. he, he died young and that's another one where you, you know, just when people, he called me and I figured he's always going to be there. And I remember not calling him back and he was gone a week later and I just oh. thought, ah, oh, I, I missed it. But he knew how we felt. And I used to go to his house once in a while. Um, I wasn't as close to Gary as I was Joe Morello or, or even Mel. But, you know, I remember one Thanksgiving I was by myself and he said, come up, let's, you know, we're having Thanksgiving dinner. So he let me come up and I hung out and we you know, talked about music. The one thing I regret is not analyzing the, the recordings he did. We were so freaked out about his teaching and getting these complicated systems down that I didn't listen to It's My Party with him. I wish I had. That's what was. That's what I wish I had done is sat with him and say, you know, what were you thinking when, you know, what 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 was important to you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, but now we've got the music. So, so. like, uh, timeline-wise, you know, you talk about Hal Blaine, and for those that don't know, Hal Blaine is one of the most recorded drummers in history. And check out a film called The Wrecking Crew. It's a great documentary yes. and talks about these West Coast players. Again, relationships, a group of friends that would do three, four recording sessions a day for about a decade and everything you heard on the the radio was these guys and gals carol Kay, um yes. playing making music together so where did gary fit in that the time what was he doing on the east coast east coast um he started i guess it was late 50s early 60s and there's one video that you can find online um uh there's a guy, I mean, it's an odd video. His name is, it was a singer named Dave Lambert, who was a jazz singer. It was part of the group Lambert, Hendricks, and Ross. Mm-hmm. And there's. Sounds like a law firm. Yes. <laughs> they, they yeah. were, that, that group was famous. I, Mr. Geist played, it, played them for us in high school. They were famous for taking jazz recordings and putting vocals to them, either words, like taking a Count Basie recording and putting a, you know, a, or you ever hear the song uh, Joni Mitchell made famous, those of you who don't know famous folk singer, jo- uh, called Twisted, My Analyst Told Me That I Was Right Out of My Head. It was a thing she covered. That was Annie Ross from Lambert Hendricks and Ross. That was her taking the jazz song Twisted and putting wow. weird lyrics in. Anyway, Dave Lambert was in that group. There was a famous filmmaker named D.A. Pennebaker who did a film about Bob Dylan mm-hmm. who decided to record Dave Lambert going to RCA New York studios to do a demo. This was early, mid, had to be mid-60s, three track, you can see it in the control room, and it's a 15 minute video, it's on YouTube, Dave Lambert at RCA. And somebody called my attention to Gary Chester is the drummer yeah. on the session. He's playing, there's no toms, it's one cymbal, George DeVivier, famous jazz bass players playing bass. And it's the only video I've ever seen of Gary playing, and yeah. it's jazz. And he sounds great, and you can hear how good his time was. Yeah. That was it, so worth checking out. The and, first rock drummers yeah. were jazz drummers. Yeah. And they, and they improvised and adapted to to play the music at the time that was coming up and I'm, there was a lot of guys that were 
you know, Hal Blaine talks about it all the time about guys being snobbish and be like, oh, I don't want to play boom, whap, boom, boom, whap, whap. And he's like, I'm going to do this and I'm going to, you know, Hal Blaine was probably the the last session drummer to have uh, Rolls Royces and yachts and mansions <laughs> and six wives. Yeah. <laughs> And it was always quick with a joke. God bless him. He was we a just, funny guy, We right? just lost him, you know? And know. you know what's really f- was, is sad that I just looked and I realized that that I was in Los Angeles when he had his birthday bash at the Baked Potato and then he died soon after. I was in town. How did I not hear about oh. it? I was so mad at myself. And I literally live a mile from the Baked oh, Potato. Oh, jeez. Um, but, you know. Although, you know, I think he was getting older and at that point it was really just every people celebrating him and totally. getting together. But, so funny. You know, Rich, who for you, you know, those, I'm thinking of the people that were important. Who were the main guys for you? Was there a whole pile of them? Well, for me, the first, the guy that I, you know, I mean, I was, you know, seven years old and everybody wanted to be Peter Chris, you know. <laughs> uh, everybody wanted to, to, to be in Kiss. And then I grew up and matured a little bit. And then um, the police came out with that record Synchronicity in 1983 yep. and Martha Quinn and MTV and... And I was like, that's what I'm going to do. And then next, the next year after, Jim was with me on this. Jim's a little younger. Today's Jim's birthday. He's 44 years old. Thank you. Guys. Happy birthday. Thank hey. you. Um, and, okay. and I've known Jim for a good 11 years or so. About that, yeah. Yeah, About totally. Over a decade. So hopefully you do something super fun tonight. I just treated him to a nice Asian lunch. It was good. It was Thank good. Um, we go. We're going to be doing kickball tonight. We, we both agree that we <laughs> Alex Van Halen was a seriously underrated drummer. Completely. Yeah. So I was coming from a rock and roll tradition, but at the same time, I was being completely overeducated because I was in the concert band, the marching band, the jazz ensemble, the pep ensemble. Right. I was playing all sorts of, in every academic environment I could. So I, I had my street training by watching MTV and playing in rock bands around my neighborhood and then playing in the jazz band and the marching band at school. Right. and. And then, you know, we, we go and we, you know, I studied with Ed Sof and I, you know, our buddy yep. Jason Sutter, who also graduated from Miami, right. says, you know, like Sof trained us like Navy SEALs to go and hunt and kill, you know, <laughs> jumping out of airplanes and like swimming He's with something else, you know, so yeah. we, he, he prepared us for real life in the real world, which is, yeah. it's a massively competitive, I think it's more competitive than ever. At the same time, there's less work. Yeah. And are you seeing that as an educator? You're the uh, professor of jazz drums right. at the University of Florida. What's no, North Florida. North yeah. Florida. Mm-hmm. What town is that? Gainesville? That's Jacksonville. Jacksonville. Okay, so that's where our our the, our guitar player in our band, Jack, who we've been playing with for 20 years, he lives in Jacksonville. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's been, well, it's, it's something, I mean, Beth is also an educator, and we talk about this every day of our lives about the work scene. I have two stepsons. They both got masters in percussion. The one went to North Texas. One right? went to North Texas. Which one was that? Uh, that's the younger. That's the younger one, Scott. Scott, that's right. And he, you know, it's not. That's not a career he's decided to pursue. Oh, did oh, because I was going to ask if he got a college job or he started to get it. He wanted to be an actor. He started oh, yeah. work. He got a couple of nice commercials in New York. Moved to L.A. It was tough. And now he's decided he wants to be in the finance world. So okay, so so since I met him, because I met yeah. him, right? You met at, Scott mm-hmm. at Zanies. Because for those mm-hmm. of you that don't that don't know my backstory, I used to be married to his psychic. Oh, we were there, and we, you guys saw, came yes, to see right. my ex-wife perform at Zanies. And and I love that you said uh, you didn't say to yourself, "Wow, this guy is." That shit crazy, and I am <laughs> never going to see him. And and my and hit I had this, a, hit that. No, I had a percussion. I'd hit that group. No, I'd hit that as a podcast, but we had a group You opened call. for your wife. Yes. Yes. Yeah. My buddy, uh, Billy, who was, awesome. was a drummer with Colby Calais, we would just take household items like filing cabinets and trash cans and staplers, mm-hmm. and we would try to get all these found sounds, and we would make music out of it, and people were like, what is happening? It was very impromptu. It, yeah. was, it was really, really What was fun. it called? Hit That? Strike That? It was called Strike That. Strike That. Yeah. It was we, great opening. You know, was the whole really thing, fun. I had a great time. Where are you, Billy? I haven't seen you. Billy? <laughs> Come on. Look me up, buddy. Um... But, but so he wanted to be an actor. That's so crazy because he was probably out in L.A. because I've been going to L.A. for seven years right. and studying acting the last four years. We may have been taking classes together or auditioning in the same building. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's tough, too. It's, and then Brian, the older one, got his master's from University of Alabama. Mm-hmm. And he's been doing 
living in New York, we, we have a little apartment where I lived for 20 years and I bought it. It was not expensive at the time in 85. Mm-hmm. It's 400 square feet. And now, and Scott lived there for a while and now Brian's living there. He just got back. I mean, it's it's a grind. It's tough to get work. It's, you, ca- you kept the apartment there? Yes, yeah, still have a, a condo. Little, a little, oh, it's, well, it's a co op, so there's yeah. rules and regulations. Oh, yeah. you, so, it's in the city? Yeah, it's on 23rd and 9th. I was oh, always wow. wondering what it, yeah. like, because I, I saw some like real estate listings, because I always check out real estate in, in major markets, and I'm right. like, wow, this is a co op. I was like, wow, that's really affordable. So the idea in a co op is, is you pay into the corporation that yes. owns the building. Yes. But it makes it's, it more manageable. It makes it manageable, but the rules and regulations about what you can do and can't do. If you want to have somebody sublet, there's really strong regulations. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a, a great trumpet player who unfortunately has passed away who was a great friend, Lou Soloff, and he lived there for five years. He had to get, I think, tw- I don't know, 10 recommendations before the co-op board would allow him to sublet. Yeah. He got a letter from Winton Marsalis. I remember he yeah, showed like, me. You're, wow. this, like, you're not going to play that trumpet in the 400 square well, feet, are you? But he, what he did is he found that... the there was a, a storage room, and he asked if he could turn it into a music studio, which he did. So there was a whole. That's thing incredible. There. So with four hundred square feet, yeah, it's is, tiny. Is there a bathroom, or is there a bathroom in the hallway? No, it's in. It's it's it's. That's kind pretty of, common for New we've York. We've renovated it, so it's one big room with a kitchen kind of part of it, and then there's a bathroom, and we made it nicer. And it's That's actually so smart. Uh, and I wish I had seen IKEA at that time, you know, because you see those 300, 400 square foot IKEA things. Everyone's mm-hmm. still telling me go to IKEA and get the meatballs. I still haven't tried <laughs> the them. meatball. Well, if I'm a, I, a vegetarian. So you, when did you become a vegetarian? Well, uh, it's been a, it's about five years. I'm, in fact, trying to be as close to vegan as I can. Yeah. Slip in and out. It's a little harder in the South. Yes. You know, Oreos are vegan. Yeah, I know they are. There's the problem. I know, I know they There's are. There's a problem with, 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 the, with, with the fat vegans. It's like, yeah. what is going on here, guys? It's because there's uh, there's like, well, it, the, the, the thought process is, well, if I'm not eating meat, I'm winning, right? But right. there's so much stuff. But you can eat French fries and think you're being vegan. Yeah. And, you know, it's kind of, which I'm. Getting back to the but, condo in New York. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. We stayed, my, my family and my mm-hmm. three kids stayed in a condo. It was probably about four or 500 square feet. A yeah. whole for, family? Yeah. Oh, my God. I mean, we were there sparingly, yeah. just overnight. But uh, I think a lot of them are like that. That's pretty common. Yeah, this was, you know, it's never going to be worth millions and millions, but it's definitely gone up in value. I just needed a place. Uh, you know, I moved into the city. What I found after I graduated school, Matheny helped me get a gig with Gary Burton, the vibraphone player. Oh, yes. Gary was based in Boston. I ended up moving to Boston, and then the Matheny group started. I was still in Boston, and I just found that I wanted uh, to be around New York. I just wanted to take it to that level. Mm-hmm. And then I, I moved back to New Jersey, and I found just by being in New Jersey a half an hour away, this is at the time that, you know, early 80s, I wasn't part of any scene. I, you know, if Elvin was playing at the Vanguard or something, I wanted to hear Elvin Jones or you know some famous jazz person. I would more than not the hassle of driving into New York and dealing with the tunnel and finding a place to park and pay for all that. Like, so I, I need to live here. Yes, yeah. I ended up moving into the city, mm-hmm. and eventually I, I sublet this place, and then it went co-op, and it was relatively reasonable for what the time was. Mm-hmm. And it was it was very small for what my friends were doing. It was again, you know, tiny. It was like a room and a bathroom and a kitchen, and there you go. But I was a road guy for I don't know twenty, twenty five, almost thirty years, probably yeah. over two hundred days on the road, and I just would throw stuff in there. And when I met Beth and she saw the apartment, I mean, that was kind of the she's like, "You point. live here? Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> if you can put up with that for for like a day." <laughs> so and, did, were you? Uh, did you have a first marriage or no? The first one, I was single till forty five. Just uh, what a smart, huh. smart man. Well, it just when you're traveling, I had a lot of nice friends, and you know, to take it further, they liked me, I didn't like them. They like I liked them, they didn't like you know that the usual relationship mm-hmm. being on the road and. I don't want to say it was the only cause of it, but you know, I, I think about that when, as it, you ask me questions about a teacher. Not only do I see the work thing very, very difficult, but also the relationships. It's it's hard. It's a hard career. I I don't know why kids wasn't on, weren't on my radar, but they weren't. None of my friends were married. Everybody was single and mm-hmm. being a road person. Yeah. And then you kind of wake up one day, and I just found it was kind of like I remember reading about some famous person who, who won an Academy Award and then went home alone, and it was like the most depressing night of his life. It was supposed to be the greatest, and it was a story about him. Nobody to share it with. Nobody share it with. Who, That's who, what who kind that? of what I was. Do you remember? Uh, I don't remember. Mm-hmm. It was just so, no, I, just something. Well, I mean, I keep. I, I've tried twice at marriage, and you know, hey, I'm a good husband, but it just you know, 200 shows. Even if you're doing 50 shows a year, oh. you're really going to be gone over 100 days because you know, yeah. I just got back from playing this. Uh, cool gig in Calgary and it was really really fun it was like city park nice mild summer 
summer air. It was a beautiful. great, beautiful night, yeah. you know, and I've been, you know, sharing my time and my, my talents with people that I love for the last 20 years. We're like a yeah. road family. But it was a day of travel to get there, a day of waiting around to play the show, and then a day of travel coming home for what they call, we call these one-off guys. And um, that's, you know, that's three yeah. days of your life. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know. It was just time, and then I met Beth, and it just, you know, do you want to move to Florida and be with two kids? Sure, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just what you don't think you're ever going to do, and then you meet somebody that yeah. just you fall in love with. And then it took a minute to kind of figure out our playing thing because we both come from different places in terms of music background. Yeah. She's a drum corps person and also got a master's from uh, Eastman. Mm -hmm. And for me to play in time with another person and play, you know, kind of like the way you were doing that, Beth is used to playing with nine snare drums for 11 minutes and everybody sounding perfect. Right. I, I'm a jazz guy, kind of loose, you know. Yeah. So it's <laughs> but your technique, if you guys don't know about, you know, Danny's technique, it's like flawless, super. Well, working on it, but different different than drum chords. Working on it. Yeah. I, I He's think, always practicing. I think you're there, man. I've you know? seen your single stroke roll, I've seen your double stroke roll, and I've seen your paradiddles, and it's a flawless. That's, well, that's like, from Joe's teaching. I do that. I do I do a, do a bar of singles, yeah. a bar of doubles, and a bar of paradiddles, right? Yep. And I just go... I, that's yeah. that's my thing. That's kind of the, my ritual. In fact, I was wondering if it just you know, the thing about J Joe Morello studied with George Lawrence Stone, who wrote the Stick Control book, and their thing was when you do that, most drummers start low and raise the stick up and go down, like up down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And their thing was that that was a flawed way to to practice because they felt that it was two motions and up was a tension causing motion. So wow. everything when you do the singles, doubles, paradiddles, you have to start at the same level and let the sticks rebound back. So everything, so you have a shot at getting the right hand and the left hand to sound the same. See, I always had those things where they said about, because my I'm a drummer as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And That's there's right. no way that I probably would have been a successful drummer like you guys have because I probably wouldn't have gotten past the whole, you know, all the books you're talking about is like you're, you're talking an alien language to me. Um, but I was always the kid in school that was the rocker. But you had feel. I and guess that, I did. And that's yeah. a whole different. And, and Gary Chester. Yeah. His his time. You know, Bernard Purdy. Time. But I mean, but, I could never yeah. really do. I've been playing drums for probably 25 years. My, my double strokes are crap. You know, I could never really get the sticks to rebound. I always mm. thought it was, you know, get, building up the muscle in your hands and your arms in order to get the sticks. That's why some of these guys would practice practice on pillows. Well, yeah. te right? te technique yeah. is just a way to get your musical <clears throat> ideas out. So there's right. no, there's, you can express, you get the your ideas out of your head. You, you know? seeing you play makes me wish I would have gone into a school band. Well, you know what you know I ever thought is. Because uh, you, you know, have the most buttery smooth double strokes yeah. I've ever seen. Well, right? Danny's <laughs> yep. got That's extreme awesome. technique and then you got to get a guy like, um, um, you Thomas Lang, mm -hmm. who does what we do with our hands with his feet. Yeah, yeah. crazy, right? And I looked at it, I go, you <laughs> See, he are did. from another planet. He put the time in probably tens and tens of thousands of yeah. hours. But a lot of guys, they, they, day. they do the initial stroke and to get the bounce off the second, right. you know, uh, I guess passive stroke. Yeah. He actually did something, and I saw some video. It might have been on Drumeo. Making uh, the second stroke. Da 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 You know. Yeah. And that's what they teach in Drumline because. Oh, do they? You've got to teach. Well, you've got to get ten guys to play a machine gun style roll perfectly together yeah. on something that sounds like a Formica countertop. <laughs> yeah. You know. I never understood yeah. that. Well, once the heads started to go to that sound, like you know, because when I was playing in marching band, I was in a four hundred piece marching band in El Paso, Texas, but we had the slings. <laughs> and we had the Ludwig that's rocker awesome. heads, you know, with the Dennis DeLucia sticks. That's what, that's what sticks. Beth played with the Spirit of Yeah, it's like you're playing a, a piece of fiberglass. With the silver dot. But, but yeah. the silver dot, there was some soul to those heads. It was mm -hmm. kind of dirty, you know, and we weren't expected to be that tight. But then when we started in, in you know, going beyond the 26 rudiments, yeah. and we've got our mm -hmm. 120 rudiments now. Oh, my gosh. And, really? and all these hybrid rudiments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah they went so, to these super tight heads. This reminds me of like, of like a marching stick. Who is the guy? Is that you're a Regal Tip guy, aren't you? Yeah. No, I'm, I use hot sticks. Hot sticks. You know who else does? Sandy Gennaro. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We we'll have to get Sandy on the podcast. So yes, Danny, absolutely. his drumsticks, he brought them with him today. Yeah. And these these are beefy, man. Do, do, they're beefy, but they're thin. They are. Now this this is not what I use with Gary Sinise because these would break at that volume. Do you use the uh, <laughs> nylon tips yeah. always? Yeah. Um, these are made by Kevin Pocalis at Hot Sticks. I've been playing them since the '80s. I, I love this guy. I love his way of uh, in It feels good. Things. I've never met him. He he built his whole business by building every machine himself. That's great. Right. And really? services them and came up with a way of putting graphics on a stick and call, you ever see the Vader sticks that have the silver stuff? He's that's his process. Huh. 
you know, came up with things that no one has ever really been. Able yeah, to you've do. always been a fan of using colored sticks, and yeah. I was like, that's kind of flashy for a jazz this drummer. Was, uh, I saw you're kind of like a rocker. <laughs> <laughs> I saw Look. Steve Jordan on the cover of Modern Drummer, early '80s, with a with a black pair of sticks, and I said, that, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah. Well, I had and those. Were, that was a Steve Gadd stick. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, that the one he it's had like was pencils. actually a hot stick because yeah. It, was yeah. even, it was even before Gadd came out with those. But, was it? Yeah. Wasn't Gadd's a Zildjian stick? Yeah. Zildjian, 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 Zildjian made sticks, and there and those are. And my sticks are black. I like them. Like now, you have that new technology. Do, do you uh, do you give these to the troops? Do you pass these out? Like sometimes, you know? when when we have gone on special trips, <clears throat> we went to Afghanistan once. We went to we played at the seventy fifth anniversary of Pearl Harbor, <clears throat> and Kevin at Hot Sticks made a batch just for those events, and we passed them out. And it was really, uh, you know, it was it was a wonderful thing to be able to do to be part of that. So. I mean. I've been to like I think sixteen or seventeen countries for the troops. We're talking like with Jason, Dubai, um, some other artists. I toured over there with a, a group called Rushlow, and then also a group uh, a kid named Rick Orozco, which was one of my first gigs when I moved. He was in uh-huh. a Mexi- Mexican American singer, and he would do like um, cumbia music and flamenco, and he would mix it oh, with nice. country. And we so we went to like Japan and Korea and Dubai and New. Is that the guy who and, called you Thunder? Um, no, th- that I was in a band in high school called Pueblo, <laughs> and and there was this um, Puerto Rican percussionist, and yeah. he would be just schooling me because I was overplaying like Neil Peart, and he was just like, "No, I just want you to play gum scatting, gum scatting," and he was like, "He got all this, all the glory." I was like, "What? It was his band, right?" So for you know the folks that don't know out there, Gary Sinise, his character on CSI New York is Mac Taylor, isn't it? Yeah. So, and yeah, but everyone knows I, him best because of Lieutenant Dan. Lieutenant Taylor. Dan, but and he, Mac yeah. is his son's name and his brother-in-law. McKenna. Interesting, yeah, interesting. interesting. And he's been doing uh, CSI New York since 2004. Right. And he, I look, I mean, he's done tons of projects with Tom Hanks. We're talking right. Apollo 13, The Green Mile, oh, and yeah. of course Forrest Gump. Yep. I mean, I love talking about the band and Gary. He's a good bass player. He's a he's a great bass player. He yeah. he plays in time. He's got great intonation. He's always in tune. And he's got big ears. You know, I'll do some little diddle thing. He's like, what do you, yeah, Danny, what is that? You know, or, or, or he'll cha- he'll try things. And you guys are around the same age, which yeah. is cool. A, yep. And he, I mean, I, I, I don't know who else, I, I can't compare him to anybody that I've ever met, but I guess it's kind of like um, what Paul Newman did with his foundation, making all that money selling food. Mm-hmm. Gary, I mean, I'll see if I can give you the, the brief, can I talk about it for a second? Totally, yeah, please, yeah. I mean, Anything you want to talk about. It's, it's, Beth and I were playing the Christmas show at Epcot, which we still do. When Beth was in Orlando, she was, uh, besides teaching, she was mainly working at Disney. She played on a ton of soundtracks and yeah. was working in Future Corps because she had a drum corps background, but she's also a great reader on Marimba and Timpani. Mm-hmm. Um, so when we got there, she was playing the Candlelight Christmas show, and mm-hmm. I ended up subbing it and then getting the gig as the drummer. And Gary Sinise was one of the narrators, and they have th- a different narrator every three days. It's a f- 50 piece orchestra it's not a whole lot of drums in Beautiful. Fact, the, dr- the drums are sort of in the background Beth is in the front jumping around hitting all this percussion so when I the people say oh you were great and, and what do you do I play drums there's drums in this show <laughs> they don't even know <laughs> but one day years into seeing Gary every year he came up and said did you didn't you used to play with Pat Metheny? And I said, how, how do you even know who that is? You're an actor. He said, well, I actually play the bass. And we just started this Lieutenant Dan band. This must have been, I think it was in the middle of 2000, the Christmas 2004, uh, because a, a few weeks later he asked, he said he started this Lieutenant Dan band, and we all kind of laughed and said, you know, how good could that be? Pretty and good. Then, yeah. And well, then yeah. He, he called, and uh, there was a guy, Kimo Williams, who had started the band with him, and he said, you know, we have a gig in Orlando. The drummer we use in Chicago can't do it. You guys want to play? Yes. And first of all, he would used to do two hour and a half sets. So there was three hours of music to learn. He didn't. He had charts. Ben Lewis, the keyboard player, always charts out every song you're going to do. So you're expected to know this. And Gary was saying, you know, if you could do it without the charts, that would be great. So to, to learn these tunes was driving me crazy because some of them are, you know, modern pop music that have odd forms that don't necessarily follow like a tip. You know, there's a couple of weird measures in there or something. But then we played for a Wounded Warrior event, which was a rough one. 
And Gary said, look, you're going to see people with no faces and noses blown off and all this stuff. And no just, way. Just go talk to them because they want to they hear from you. They wow. Meet. So we went and Beth brought a friend of hers, Sharon, who uh, we sat at a table before the event and she was sitting with a guy who had just had his legs replaced with uh-huh. prosthetics. And before the end of the night, Sharon had him up on stage playing a tambourine. So it was a life changing huh. thing. But Gary started this as something just to do as he went on a, after 9-11, well, he was in Forrest Gump, plays a disabled vet, the American disabled vets, uh, as he explains it, honored him, and it freaked him out because he, I'm just an actor, no, no, you played a vet who came back, we want to give you, you know, let you know that it means a lot. So he started working with them, went on a, after 9-11, went on a volunteer tour to, I, I guess it was to Iraq, but didn't want to shake hands. He said, you know, I can play music, let me see if I can put this band out there. So in 03, he did a little, they, the USO let him bring a little band. And that's when we met him in 04. And he was doing maybe five to 10 gigs a year. Mm-hmm. And if it made a few bucks, you know, he would, he would pay us a little something to do it. And if it made a few dollars, he would donate it. That started to become a bigger thing. We started to play casinos and things like that. And Joe's Bar on uh, yes in Chicago. In, in Chicago, Joe's Bar. Yeah. We ended up, uh, we would play, you ever play the Coach House in uh San Juan Capistrano? Uh, yes. I haven't yet. We played that. And yeah. I used to play there with uh, Matheny, with Michael Franks, with a million. Uh, Mahavishnu played there, I Big think. Big Michael Franks fan. Oh, oh, cool. He's still around, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What just, a buttery voice. And who was... Um, Did you ever hear any of that music? It's like like smooth jazz yeah. with a killer vocalist. Um, no. Michael Great. Franks. Michael Franks. In yeah. fact, um, Richie Morales, who played with Spyro Gyro for years, I just saw a post. He's now He just did a gig within the last week or two with Michael Franks. Yeah, this is uh, some something you probably wouldn't know about me, listeners, um, because I'm just the bash rock guy in Nashville. But there was a time that I loved smooth jazz. We're talking like Spyro Gyro, the Rippingtons, um, Fat Burger. Yeah, no kidding. Um, like, that was the yeah, thing. Exactly. I was going to go, I was going to move to Los Angeles in, in um, to, uh, let's see, what the year would have been... 1996 to play to pursue that mm-hmm. you know I love Dave Cos I love well, you can hear the sensitivity stuff. in your playing because you, you you know you orchestrate I loved that you really, no yeah. what you do so thank you oh yeah, my yeah, God. Yeah, yeah. I really that's, I, that's what the mullet was for I definitely. still love that music yeah I was a late bloomer with the mullet <laughs> Me I was too. like you know what if I uh, I don't want to cut this thing off what if like long yours hair, was glorious oh it was a uh, VO5 hollow oh treatment uh, <laughs> mullet I it, think, it was like it was like Danny a, I think you've had some kind of uh, you had like a weckleish haircut at one point did you that was the thing to do Kind of like the, hi- the I had hippie long. long what is what's this gig here? I'm looking online too, too here. Too lazy to go to the barber. Lugano. <laughs> what's this? This was that a band of yours, Lugano, or was that a song? Oh, that's that's a city in Switzerland play, oh. playing with John McLaughlin. I oh got my! To, I got God. to play in a version of the Mahavishnu orchestra. That's incredible. So, is it weird to go on YouTube and see yourself in so many videos? No, I I like it because it's just sort of a souvenir of that time period. And right. This is oh what, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then this yeah. is you playing with some local guys because, believe it or not, guys, we have a killer jazz club now in Nashville called Rudy's, Rudy's Jazz. Rudy's, yeah. And so you play down there a lot with um, Jeff Berlin. Moved to town, right? Yeah, yep. He's, in fact, he lives very close to. What's the best way for people to to contact you? Like, if they want to take lessons or pick your brain, um, email or just go to UNF or I'm on the Gary Sinise Lieutenant Dan Band website. There's a whole my email. No, is Danny there. Gottlieb. Com or no? Oh, uh, Danny Gott at AOL is my email. Danny Gott, G O T T. Danny Gott. And, and you're, you're Italian, Danny right? 100 percent Italian. A little Italian, mostly mm-hmm. Austrian, German, Jewish. Uh, and a little Italian from the South. Okay, so yeah, you're so you're like uh, I'm Italian, Irish, Welsh. Redmond is Irish, Welsh. That's oh, my dad, no. and then my mom was Paradiso, mm-hmm. a, Paradiso. which means paradise. So paradiso, if you took my name yeah. Richie mm-hmm. and you call me Dick, it'd be Dick Paradise. All right, where's hey. the where's the thing? That? That's the bomb. Where, but oh, it's yeah. the, I don't you hear got, it. You Hold got on. The, the, there uh, it is. The Kramer, there we go. Uh, <laughs> Shazam! All right, that's my that's my drum tech, John Hall. Right, we awesome. got we got to pot up the sound effects. What about some claps? What about some claps, bud? Uh, here we go. Yes! Wow, I love that. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I love that. You know what? And there's nothing there's nothing better than having a steady job. I mean, working with Gary. Yes, I was going to continue. With you that. know, like uh, since 2004, that's a great job. Well. It's a great job, but it's more. It's so impressive to see what this guy did with his life, with his platform. He, I mean, you know, he used he, it for I mean, the good see, of humanity. Yeah, I mean, beyond belief. In fact, he just came out with a book called "Grateful American," and he, you, we, Beth, and I read it. And it's like, wait, he did all of that too. You know, it's you know, he, this is a guy who you know was late to acting, uh, had a teacher that just kind of 
you know, he was playing in a band and he was kind of a lost sort of kid. And the teacher said, you know, in high school, you, you know, you guys look like a bunch of hoods. We're doing West Side Story. Why don't you audition? And he went, all right. And he saw a bunch of, as he described, he saw a bunch of girls going in. So, well, acting in high school, that's a pretty early start. That started. That's and, and, you know, he talks about, he wasn't even one of the main people, but he was such a good organizer that they made him take a credit for the production. And he's somebody who just gets an idea and finds a way to do it. He executes. He started Steppenwolf Theater in Chicago. Mm -hmm. He and John Malkovich and Terry Kinnan or whoever those pe the people were that he went to high school wanted to have a platform to act. So they start a theater in a church. And he described they didn't have enough money to get toilet paper, so he would st he stole he was a groundskeeper at Ravinia, so he stole the toilet paper. <laughs> and one time later, as a famous actor, he was on Regis or something, and they br he brought out a wheelbarrow of toilet paper, and then he got arrested. You know, it was like a whole bit that oh they my did. God! But he just found a way to start that that theater, and so here we are, Lieutenant Dan Band. We're playing a couple of gigs. The first um, quad quadruple amputee comes back from Afghanistan. No limbs. No limbs. And a group in New York wanted to build a home. So Gary donates the band. We play. They raise the money. Second one comes back. And this is an abbreviated version, but he decides to partner with these other groups and then decides that he can't control where the funds are going. So he stops that and in 2011 starts his own foundation and has a bunch of wonderful people that are really good fundraisers. Yeah, you need staff. People. Putting yeah. the integrity and into it. They've built 54 homes now. Oh, wow. But it's not just that. He, We used to play this event called Snowball, where uh, for years it was in Fort Worth, sponsored mainly by American Airlines, where they bring kids that lost a parent in Iraq or Afghanistan as a four-day bonding, they, you know, balloons and a ticker tape parade through the town. Gary took it over because he loved this so much and now flies them all to Disney World. They did it last year. Now they're doing it again this year. And we play for that. That's awesome. I was sitting next to a girl on the plane the other day who just started working for Gary's foundation. And I said, what do you do? And she said, well, uh, I'm in charge of a program that deals with first responders. I have to find people that are in need. And we have a fund that we... She just bought a van for a police officer that had been shot three times and couldn't drive a normal car. That found from Gary's foundation. Wow. Said, she said, "Yeah, my job is to make sure it's legit. Find these people and get them, get them what they need." You got to connect him with Mike Rowe with yeah. uh, returning the favor. You know okay. what I mean? I don't know who that. Is. Who's that? He's a guy from Dirty Jobs. Remember oh. Mike Rowe? He uh, he hosted exactly. the show uh, Dirty, Dirty Jobs. Jobs. So he, he it would focus on all the wonderful people in the world that get yeah. things done. He he and Gary are very much aligned oh, by doing dirty jobs that we don't want to okay. do. But, but then you realize they make a ton of money doing dirty jobs. Like I tell people all the time, he says, "Let's inv keep investing in real estate." I said, "You know what we need to do? We need to invest in shitters." <laughs> Man, what? Everybody needs the poop, right? <laughs> Beep. You want to you want to um, clean them? Just okay, that, no, that's the thing. Some <laughs> someone will do that job. <laughs> Someone has to do the job. But no, they, you make big bucks renting those things out to music yeah. events and construction sites. Sure, oh, yeah. They, no. Someone does. I mean, that is a basic human a need Crappy more job, than even drumming. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, you know, he did a show about dirty jobs of people who have okay. to do all the stuff that you don't want to do. That you'd never think that someone has to do this kind of a job. Yeah. Well, he's just invented ways. You know, he, he used to go to hospitals and mm -hmm. we would play, you know, Christmas time in the lobby. And he said... We should do a concert outside. So now every year we go to Brook Army Medical Center and we go to San Diego Medical Center. We go to Walter Reed, Fort Belvoir. He hooked up with Robert Irvine, that famous chef from Restaurant Impossible. Your food sucks. You know, that kind of. <laughs> and, and he cooks for the troops and the and the staff. They get the staff to cook. There's 5,000 people. They, they, we do it every year. He just, he's just an amazing guy. So as far as a steady gig, we're just he just wants to keep the band going as a platform. Mm -hmm. The band is now just a smaller part of a much bigger thing. And, and a lot of the gigs now are corporate events. Home Depot is a big donor to Gary, so we just played their corporate oh, cool. party. Um, Sunbelt Rentals with the big trucks. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. When, what he does is when he builds a home for a soldier, he gets these bigger corporations to do the floor, to do the, the windows, and then he gets local businesses who would love to partake in that. Yeah, so they, they can't be roughing an electric or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, so he's or, a know. networking guy and, and great. So it's been fun to, and now Tom Bones Malone from The Letterman Show and from yeah. Blues Brothers, he's in the band. So That's great. How many guys are in the band? 13. 13 oh my God. You got a horn section, several singers, yeah, five percussionist. Singers. And it's all yeah. covers and All things. covers. It's geared toward a military audience, but mm -hmm. it's like a Vegas show. And Gary is... He's got a lot of energy. Like, yeah. even though he's just slapping the bass up there, yeah. he's jumping around stage. Is he singing? He's very, he, no. 
Thank goodness. <laughs> He's not no a singer. Offense, well, no, I mean, Gary, it sounds like to me, like we, like I would get along with him because I'm a networker. Yeah. I'm a late, so am I. Yes, I'm a late yeah. bloomer yeah, yeah, yeah. in life with some of my skill sets. He, how and old was he when he started acting? I 30s? do not sing. Um, sounded like he was in high school. Yeah. But I mean, I, you know, his first yeah. big break was Lieutenant Dan. Yeah, there was some, a few 1994. things 1994. Yeah, not before that. That was the first big. Yeah. Uh, you definitely need your big, yeah. your first big break. Yeah. But what a great thing to be associated he's, with. He just found a window and he's just going for it and the band keeps going. And, and the singers are all, everybody, you know, works other things around it. And the singers yeah. all, you know, work on the harmonies and they sing great. And, you know, so, so one one person's really good with the rock song. Somebody's good with the country. Somebody's good with the classic rock. You know, everybody. Do you guys travel in military vehicles, like a military plane to get to the gig? Or is it a, just a Southwest cage. Airlines? I'll see you there. Actually, the big sponsor is American Airlines. Air American Airlines. And okay. they provide, if it's a military related event, they give us a mileage ticket. We don't get miles for it, but they figure out a way to get us there. And occasionally they have a, uh, they'll have an, uh, um, uh, what's it? What's the, uh, uh, it used to be called the American Eagle. It's now uh, Envoy. It's mm -hmm. called, and they'll they'll give us a plane, and and that way we can land on a base and not have to deal with security and yeah. all that stuff. So have you ever landed um, on an aircraft carrier? Gary has, not us. We were supposed to, and then the, the thing got canceled. What kind of plane was he in, though? I don't know, but he does. He goes with up, you know, in, in these amazing jets. In fact, yeah. he usually videotapes it and puts it on his website. That's and amazing, all that kind of stuff. But so, so they're a sponsor. When are you guys in Nashville? Next time. The only thing we've done, we've played Fort Campbell a couple times. Mm -hmm. and, Kentucky. and now it's not, it's just, it's either got to be a corporate event. We have, but nothing, nothing lately. We, we had fun. We got to, it was almost what you do. It wasn't in the stadium, but we played it at a Braves game last week. Which yeah, that's cool. It was out, they have a park outside. We did one for the Padres and one for this. That was fun. It's, You're set up in the outfield or on the mound. Well, and they have a, a, a field, a, a park that's part of the, it, it's, if you have a paid admission, you can get to go sit in the park. So, yeah. So we were the after Get baseball game uh, concert. So, so you know, I, I, when I look at you and what, at the stadiums that you're playing, I'm going ah. Well, know, it's so. It, it, we're both uh, DW drum artists, aren't yeah. we? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how long have you been with them? Well, it's been maybe six, seven years. Something yeah, I like think that. it's been about nine years for me. And yeah. Just wonderful people, oh, and no, no stone is unturned as far as quality no, and innovation. Fantastic. Always. And, and Garrison is always putting up with me, <laughs> trying to come up with... I was out there lately, uh, recently, and I, I just saw some of the finishes that they have. There was one that was like tree stump finish. Yeah, they're always... What about the one that they, the wood that they found at the bottom of the lake? Of Lake Erie or something. Yeah. yeah, I almost bought that. I almost bought every single thing they've come out the, with. But the I, reason why I they could charge an extra $3,000 for a 10, drum? 10 grand for a drum set. Yeah, <laughs> Beth, look at this. <laughs> look at this. Only 10, it's, 15, it's 1,500 years old. I know. Imagine how great it'll sound. And it's got 60-month like, financing at 2 <laughs> percent <laughs> danny feel how heavy that is and then john comes up with the john good comes up with that the, the almond drum mm -hmm. which is this lifelong dream that thing must weigh uh, 500 pounds yeah. i don't know it's like it's, beth is like, you're gonna like, you're gonna put that in the drums what was it car? carl like the weight of it, carl palmer's uh what that, did he have back the, in the 70s the uh, metal set that, it was a metal set yeah, yeah, yeah. it was yeah. made out of gold or something like that do you um yeah there's a uh, the people have loved that set. That's a, that's a special. Yeah. You know, a little shout out to a friend. Uh, I don't know if he'll ever hear this broadcast, but Ian of course Palmer. He, will. he better. Uh, uh, Ian Palmer is the nephew of Carl Palmer. Um, at Carl, uh, Ian's dad and Carl were are, were brothers. His dad has passed away. Ian is an amazing case of a, of a wonderful person who's a great drummer and also is an airline pilot. He flies oh, wow. for Virgin Atlantic, but huh. he, he plays a lot. Um, he, as a kid, took lessons with Joe Morello because his father used to bring him to study with Joe and I, I met him and he's amazing and just to see he as he talks about is he still continues drumming but found another career so he flies for this airline and he had some physical problems and overcame them and doing really really well so I, I love him and I just wanted to mention of course that. do you guys remember that modern drummer uh, where Carl Palmer's wife snapped a picture of him practicing by the pool no do you remember that it was actually uh, literally him in like a speedo out in, mm -hmm. on a lounger, yeah. with a, he was just basically with a, the stick in his left hand, just whacking a yeah. pad. But he was a practicer, obviously. Yeah. yeah. And, and great, great. Even by the pool. Yeah. Hey, one thing, you asked me about the Harold oh, Jones book. Yeah. Yeah, I was Tell us. Just talk about this. This was, again, you know. It's a big book. Uh, yeah. I, well, Huge. I, you know, I, got, I helped, was dealing with Joe with his first book, and then yeah. uh, and, and um, uh, uh, Gary Chester with that. I got to play in Ayerto Moreira's band. Ayerto, great Brazilian percussionist, oh, helped beautiful. him with a book in the early 80s just so I could learn what he did. Mm -hmm. Harold Jones, 
for those of you who may not know of Harold, Harold is an amazing drummer who in the 60s played with Count Basie and is on a couple of pr- very prolific albums. One is called Basie Straight Ahead. Was he on Shiny Stockings? Uh, on that track, <laughs> not necessarily the only version, but he played on that. Yeah. But in the 60s, this album came out, Basie Straight Ahead, and the thing that made that album significant, it was the first time that Kendor Music published Sammy Nestico's charts. So high school, middle school, and college kids could play those arrangements. You gotta try. And yes, that's one of them. Yeah. yeah and, they're, and they're still there. Um, well, actually, you know, you got to try was was Buddy Rich. Oh, you're right. Yeah. that. But Nestico, if you're in a high school jazz band or a college right. jazz band, you're playing Nestico yes. arrangements. Yeah, basically straight ahead. I never played time, those. Fun time. <laughs> <laughs> well, they have a different path, but you know. So, 68, Mr. Geist, I'm just starting drums. My, you know, high school teacher said, the first thing he said to me is, you got to hear Basie straight ahead. He didn't know it was Harold Jones, but he said, That's, you got to hear that recording. And also he pointed me to Art Pepper Plus 11, a recording with Mel Lewis, who I luckily got to hang out with too. So I heard this Basie Straight Ahead recording, big influence. And I went to uh, Atlantic City with my parents, 68. So I was uh, born in 15. So I was 15. And it was a Sunday and I just kind of wanted to get away from them. <laughs> so I walked away by myself and they had a, have a thing there called Steel Pier. This is before gambling, Atlantic City, just a resort place. And Steel Pier was a pier that went out in the ocean and there's a, a casino in the back, a big ballroom. And what's going on? Basie's band is playing. Count Basie's playing a matinee. And I'm just there. And I look at the drummer and the drummer looks at me and he points and he goes, are you a drummer? And I go, yeah. He goes, come here. And oh my he grabs gosh. me and puts me next to the bass drum. Sit here, kid. Sit here, kid, for two sets. I'm just sitting there. And they had a, I think, uh, a, one of his, uh, another kid who was a relative of his was there visiting, and they had a thing behind the bandstand where they had a, a you ever hear about the, they had a woman on a horse that would dive into a pool? With yeah, a diving yeah, horse. yeah, yeah. So we went and watched the diving horse and then went back to basic. So he became a lifelong friend and, and teacher. So I would follow him around. He came to Miami when we were at school with Basie. He got me in. Yeah. Uh, then Mathe- when I was touring with Matheny, we played. So after Basie, he then joined Sarah Vaughn's group, the great, famous, incredible jazz singer. And he was with her for about 10 years until she passed away. And then he played with Natalie Cole. And then now for the last at least 15 years, he's been playing with Tony Bennett. Oh, and he's wow. still on the road with Tony. They work like what we like what we do. They're on the road. I'm probably even more. They're on every time I look on the Tony's website, there's another twenty gigs. He plus. lives in hotels, that old Tony Bennett. He's never there had are, a place. I, and and it's not just like you know, it's okay, Cleveland, London, Boston, Miami. You know, it, it, they just jump all over. Yeah. And Harold is still... Now, now Clayton uh, Cameron did that for a yeah. while. What's Clayton doing now? Uh, I think he just had it and wanted to get off the road. I oh, mean, yeah. still sounding great from what I understand. So Harold Jones, that's a name. Harold, and, and so this yeah. is a workbook. So Is there some I, play-alongs? Or? This, what I did is I always... I mean, I should tell you what it was triggered from. There's... When I was studying with Joe Morello... I mean, all these stories have like all kinds of stuff to it, but... I used to go to Joe's house a lot and pick him up and sometimes even just take a lesson at his house. I was sitting on a pad. And one day I went over there and Joe's sitting in his bathroom. And this is, if you can even imagine a time when there's no internet and, and none of the things that we have now, Dave Brubeck sent Joe a VHS tape of them playing with Dave Brubeck from the 60s, yeah. which today you can see a hundred of them. But then it, to see Joe play with Brubeck was impossible. So Joe's watching himself and I had a video camera because I always tape my lessons and I said can I tape you watching yourself he said yeah so I put the tape on and I got a video of Joe watching hey Gottlieb look at that see you know he's doing something with his left hand yeah look at that how about that you can't do that ah you know or something you know whatever he would say but it was a wonderful moment and thinking about Harold I thought you know Harold's still with us the Basie Straight Ahead recordings were from the 60s, and there's also another one for those drummers who are listening that may have not heard this. It's it's all over. You can find it on uh, Spotify or Apple Music called Standing Ovation. It's a live recording of the Basie band. To me, it's that's all you need to know about swing drumming. So what I did is I decided, asked Harold, can I come out to your house and just sit and listen to these recordings and tell me what you thought of it and what you did? Yeah. So I made, I think, four trips out to San Francisco. He lives north of uh, San Francisco. Not a bad place to go. Yep. 
And just when he was off the road, we'd sit and listen to him with Basie. And uh, just to do that was just such a... That's incredible. It's a piece of musical history. So for those guys that want to practice a swing feel out there, play along with the Basie recordings. Play along with Duke Ellington. Glenn Miller, Tony Dorsey, some of that early stuff, just to get that feel under your... Gene Krupa. Yeah, of course. Gene was my guy. Yep. And this, you can see, what I did is I wrote out a composite of the band. Right. And then I wrote out within reason what he played the figures and now because we're in such a you know modern techno era you don't have to include a cd anymore plus to get the rights the mechanical rights to these songs would be impossible you just include the link to spotify you just go on apple music apple or music. youtube and yeah. find them almost all of them are there there's a lot of dots and lines i see that's yeah. incredible and yeah. this is this is just this, this is basically a guy <laughs> it's, 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 it's a big band you is perhaps down, right? it's really perhaps my favorite style to play and if yeah. you can get trained on yeah. controlling the tempo and the time in the cool. field thank you so much yeah, of um of 17 guys you're gonna yeah. have a much easier time and, with a four-piece band and the band. thing Look about harold i know beautiful. what's what who's it, publishing that i we did self-published self-published on amazon. and so oh, was, oh so people could buy it on amazon you buy it on amazon same as me hey yeah, you control did, everything i didn't want to insult harold with you know a, a 40 dollar a year royalty on something you know because it's so hard to sell these books so we just you know, in fact, that's one of the joys of teaching. University of North Florida. There's a gentleman there, Mike Boyles, who's in the the uh, uh, the uh, they help me with my online classes, but he's also an amazing graphic designer. So the school sponsored Beautiful. this. Check this out, guys. And yeah. allowed, allowed me to use the. It's school. a very classic so, look to the yeah. book itself. There's a young Harold and Jones. Now that is a, cl- a special picture. That's Harold playing at the White, White House. House, and he was. One of, if not the first, jazz drummers to play there. This was uh, on the invite of um, Jackie Kennedy. He was playing with uh, Paul Winter Consort. Those that, those are some different times. Yeah, yeah. In, in American it's, history, it's amazing that. In fact, that drum set's already been donated to uh, that, that new African American oh, no, yes. the, the museum that's in Washington. <clears throat> is there. So this is uh, uh, listening to Harold. But what's interesting is for those of us that cite, you know, read big band charts. You see a figure written like boo va doo da da ba doo da boo da. You want to kind of jump right. over it. He picks and chooses kind of accent points. Boo doo doo ba doo ah. He'll hit only one of the notes. Not booth ba ba. Yeah. Or, or the band will go um ba da. He'll go ba da. But uh, instead of playing the figure, he'll answer it or do it's beautiful musical things like no other big band drummer I've ever heard. And you have to re- you can't always do that on the first pass. No, you've got to find your way around that. Really know the arrangement. Yeah. that always blew me away about Buddy Rich. Buddy Rich couldn't read music, so he would have a stunt drummer come in, read yeah. the arrangement down, and after one or two listens, he would have it memorized. Right, and, and Dennis Chambers is the same way. Dennis Chambers doesn't read, yep. and he really? memorized all that stuff in Schofield's band and. and and, Ma- and with John McLaughlin. Some people can just do that. But you know what? The ultimate question is, uh, how would Neil do it? You know? <laughs> At the end of the day, that's How what would Neil Peart do it? That's right. Well, he is the household name on drumming. If people say a, a yeah, drummer, they, they, right. they, they're going to think Dave Grohl, John Bonham, or Neil Peart. <laughs> and now somebody else in there. We Tommy talking, Lee. Tommy Lee. Or, um, I called Neil Peart the common man's drummer. Mm. I mean, everybody knows him. Yeah. Because it's just an immensely popular And they, and they can't, nobody can drummer. pronounce his last name. Is it, well, it's apple, is it potato, potato, you know. Yeah. yeah. Peart. Peart. Pasty, peisty. Pert. And I'm just happy that he was interested in, in Buddy Rich enough to do that whole project. Oh, the burning for Buddy? Yeah. yeah. The one thing I wish, no offense at, you know, to Kathy or anybody else, but I wish they had released it with no drums on it. So mm-hmm. we could all play along with it. But that, yeah. they, they could probably dig up the files. Yeah, someday that would be... They got to put it on Guitar Hero with all the different tracks and take <laughs> the drums out. Like they did all the classic songs. You know, uh, the, I, the drummer that did all the um, Guitar Hero stuff is a guy named Joel Taylor. He's an L.A. drummer. I know that and, name. And he, he got all the right gear for that period, each period of music, mm-hmm. would research and go, oh, Keith Moon would have played this, went out and got the kits, learned everything note for note. And from what I understand, everything was a complete buyout, no royalties. So it's like, hey, kid, you want the job or not? You know, yeah, someone's going to do the which, job. But that brings us to the idea of the state of the current music industry. With you being an educator on the forefront, University of North North Florida, North Florida. Mm-hmm. What do you tell a kid that's 18 years old? He's got four years to get it together and practice. What do you tell him? Well, it's 
to tell you the truth, and uh, uh, you know, I almost try to talk them out of it nah. before they come to school. That's great. Lay down the reality. I don't want you to go into this thinking that you're going to find fame and fortune, and that's a guarantee, and this is the <clears throat> career path for you. In fact, it's it's hard because I have to deal with parents too who listen to my kid. Doesn't he sound great? You know, he's going to come to school and. And I go, you know, I want you to know what you're getting into, which is this is not an easy career and it's not a given and it's nowhere near the environment that most of the teachers you're studying with, you know, got to enjoy, especially with me in the 70s and a million places to play. Yeah. You know, it can be done, but it's a long shot. And there, you think about how many schools there are in America or around the world. But, you know, if you think about Berkeley, you think about, you know, uh, New England Conservatory, NYU, Manhattan, SUNY Purchase, Miami, IU, uh, you know, the, the list goes on. And everybody's graduating music majors. Yeah. And, you know, at our school, which is predominantly kind of a bebop jazz school, what are you doing with that? It's great to learn like you're studying classical music and, and gives you great training. But in terms of reality, I mean, what am I? I'm playing Uptown Funk. You know, here I am, Mr. Jazz Guy. Is there a commercial program at the school too where you're Not, playing, or a commercial ensemble? It, there isn't. To, and I don't like that, but that's kind of the way the school is. Mm-hmm. But I try to make sure that everybody that studies drums, you know, listens to you. Yeah. You know, they, they, they got to know what you're doing, what what a, what a current person on the scene who's who's successful. Well, Nashville is an there. option for people to move yeah. to. So you look like yeah. you got three cities to work with. And I always tell the kids, yeah. get a Southwest Airlines ticket and spend three or four days in each city and mm-hmm. see if the, even the culture of the city and the way people travel. Is it right. a subway? Is it living in your car? Is it here in Nashville? Right. We've got bad traffic now, but I mean, you could own a home. Right. You know, you got dirt beneath your feet. There's actually a cassette somewhere with me playing on a demo. Yeah, that has yet to see the light of day. That's gonna that's gonna be earth shattering. I think that I we need to find some, this. Yeah, and bring it to the show. We'll bring it to the show, and you'll, you should do that. Yeah. Are you playing now? You do, can do some playing. I, I haven't played in months, but I was going to ask you when next yeah. time you're in Nashville, can we sit in? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> you can say hey, no, you know what? If he's going, if he's going to do his Rudy's jazz ever be, gig, <laughs> he wants to play, man, and enjoy himself. I, I want to play with Gary Sinise. I'll, I'll play percussion badly. Yeah, that's come his, on, that's his yeah. wife's gig. We, we drag. Robert Show me Hooper. some papers with a lot of dots and lines on it, and I'll just go. Okay. <laughs> You'll be, you'll be really quiet. Uh, but you know, th- that, that education thing is the biggest question because everybody has a dream, and I don't want to be the person that ruins But you know what? Dream. I'm going to tell you right now, I went to broadcasting school, right. and I went to radio. Listen yeah. to that voice. There was a guy who leveled with all of us and said, look, if you're not willing to move around this country for this job, you might as well think about doing something else. Yeah. Okay? Right, right, right. And, and I never forgot it, you know? It's, there's there's ways of making it like what Rich has been doing. I mean, in this day of of having free publicity and advertising and rising above the right. noise, there's ways of doing it. You just got to figure. You got to find your. You path. just got to find your path. And I had a you know this past weekend was auditions at UNF uh, auditions for the ensembles. Yeah. And again, I'm kind of I just I took on a couple of new students and and you know different levels. And of course, I'm saying you know do, do you know what you're getting into here? You know, it's a lot of work. <laughs> And one of them, you know, I said, you know, we're going to be focusing on jazz. And, you know, the odds of you getting to play jazz in its pure form is so, you know, he said, no, listen, I love hip hop music. I've been playing some of that. I see hip hop and jazz kind of blending. I just want to learn about this. Mm -hmm. And also a lot of people are opting for a program that we have, which is called Music Tech, which is how to learn to be a recording engineer. And at first I thought... Okay, another career that's fading away. What good is that going to be? But what it does is it allows you to have your home studio and record your own music. One of the, my top, my master student there has a studio in his house. I just recorded. He's got a great sound on the drums. He he lives with a, a guy who's a rapper, so they do all kinds of recordings. And you know that's you got to do so many different things, and that's what I would encourage. You know, you're in school. You can learn. You can learn Pro Tools. You can learn Sibelius. You can learn how to arrange. You can learn how to write. You can learn how to compose. It's not just about the drums, but if you want to just kind of say, all right, I'm going to throw myself to the world like we did, and I know it's going to be hard. And, you know, if you have the attitude, I'm just going to see where the music takes me, and then that you're realistic about it, that you decide if it's what you want to do. I mean, I think you have to want to really do this. When I picked up that drum pad, it was the coolest, coolest thing yeah. I ever did. And I still feel that way. I can't I I just wanted to play drums. I I'm you know, we're so lucky, all of us, that we've had a chance to yeah. do some playing. 
and and well, I mean, you know, that you're being yeah. very modest. Well, I mean, I mean, you 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 were part of jazz history. Yeah. Well, I just got lucky to and, you know, and, and I was in Connecticut White Bread. <laughs> yeah, that was his remember band. Those guys? Connecticut White Bread. No, mm-hmm. no, we don't remember them, but I'm I'm we take your word for it that you guys had a great time. <laughs> that was the, that was a band. Earth shattering. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go with that. <laughs> Good timing on that one. <laughs> I don't even know what these buttons are, but I just know <laughs> something right is going to happen. You know, wah, 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 you know, one of those kind of. Things. But we do have so much fun. But I, I would say, guys, maybe make sure you guys go and get out, yeah. get this book. It's on Amazon. Interpretation of Big Band Swing yeah. Drumming, and it's each song has within reason Harold's reaction. to to hearing himself oh mm-hmm. yeah you know at letter B the band did this and that's why I did this and that kind of stuff that's and, incredible and the ones that he didn't comment on I just write hey listen to this I've had I've a couple of kids are using it and it's like night and day I mean you know I get to judge probably like you do you get to hear you know high school bands and you judge and I hear these spacey charts all the time and in one second two measures I can tell if they listen to Harold or not mm-hmm. you know because he had some classic fills when he would do triplet fills Instead of you know, he yeah. would, he went for the the back part of the beat. Yes, that's what that's set where the swing up. is. And, that's what Neil would do. And yeah, and maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I, again, I don't know Neil's playing. He's really just riding this horse. Okay, okay. <laughs> that, you know, you're right. That's just what Neil would do. <laughs> We love Neil. We love Neil. Yes. Neil, you know, has inspired. I, you know, ding, I, ding, I, ding, 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 ding. You, you were talking about, uh, you know, broadcasting. My best friend in New York is Ken Dashow, who is mm-hmm. a broadcaster. He's on Q1043. Mm-hmm. He's one of the few who's been lucky enough to have a career in broadcasting. He was at NEWFM for years. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah. been doing this and doing uh, podcasts. And, we, and he also hosts this Breakfast with the Beatles show every Sunday. Mm-hmm. Wow. Uh, it's on iHeartRadio syndicated. It's I think great. I've heard that, yeah. Yeah, he's the greatest. And he was telling me about some band. We were just talking about music, and there's some band that sounds like Led Zeppelin, Van Zeppelin. Oh, it's uh, Greta Van Fleet. Yes, mm-hmm. that is so popular. And he was saying that a lot of musicians that hear this, it might have even been Robert Plant, that what do you think of that band? And he's saying, you know, it's a copy, you know, it sort of yeah. sounds like this. And he interviewed, was it Slash or some somebody who said this is the most important band ever and and he said why said because there's real people playing real instruments and And it's coming full circle and they're bringing a whole generation into the listening room to hear where Greta got their influences from yes but it's also funny that you say that about broadcasting because if you look at podcasts how they're starting to roll out now that's the new radio yeah right and now you're going to start seeing uh, a lot of podcasts are being done the way old time storytelling radio used to be. Beautiful, done. that's great. So it's coming around full circle, you know. Yeah, for yeah, like yeah. all the guys that are getting into like the, your students, yeah. There's always a glimmer of hope in terms of saying, look, you got to trailblaze. You got to find yeah. out what the next trend's going to be. I mean, big band had a resurgence. Yeah. Then you know what was it? Yeah, uh, Cherry Pop and Daddies and Royal right. Crown Review and yeah. the, movies, the movie Swingers. You know, I I used to sub for Mel at the Vanguard. Yeah, the Van, that's heavy. The Vanguard band. When he was alive, he it was me and Peter Erskine, John Riley, and uh, Kenny Washington. We all used to kind of now. Daniel Glass that. is doing some of that work. Oh, I think. Oh, oh that's mm-hmm. great. Good for it, yeah. it, Well, it, Riley has you know since Mel passed away has been he's been there longer than Mel was. Yeah. And, uh, but I remember I saw Brian Setzer a night that I played. I know he probably wouldn't even have noticed, but he came to hear Mel's band and I I was playing and I thought, what is Brian Setzer doing hearing Mel's big band? Yeah. And then there it went. You know, then we found yeah. out when he, he was soaking up those influences. Cool. Yeah. You know, <laughs> just a fun one last thought. <laughs> now sure. and with both of you guys being so heavily classically trained in this kind of music, uh, your interpretations, your impressions on the movie <laughs> I can't give a lesson without thinking of that, but go ahead. Chris. I, I, I personally think that any vehicle like that that has mass appeal, a major Hollywood film, award winning. Isn't that a true story, though? Giving, it's, I, I tell everybody that it's very much based on University of North Texas. Is that how it was? Yeah, it was iron. Wow. Well, we Six, had, seven, eight. We had, I, we, had, we had educators that were very tough on us and that demanded the most from us. They throw chairs across the room and stuff? Or? Maybe there was a particular... <laughs> no, it wasn't that bad. But maybe, but maybe there was a particular educator that the writer had in mind. But I, And people were like, oh, it wasn't really him playing. Well, the actor, he's you know, he's played a boxer. He's played a superhero. He's a great actor. Yeah. Then for the close-ups, they had a real drummer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's great. It brings drummers to the forefront of people's minds. 
That that seems to be the consensus of just the overview of looking at that. I remember when I first saw it, I I was offended at first, <laughs> and I thought like that's not how well, you play a jazz ride yeah, pattern. The guys hitting the the students saying, "Am I rushing? Am I dragging?" You know, mm-hmm. you can't you can't do that in a you know. And I thought what you're not getting is the beauty of what playing and learning that music is. You're making it a sport event, and the guy's got to practice hard. And his hands are bleeding, and the guys, mm-hmm. put, you know. And and I thought about it, and 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 Lou Soloff, may he rest in peace, loved that movie. And he, I would say, but Lou, it's not. It's his movie. It's a movie. It's great. And Stepson Scotty saw it, and he said, Danny, if they just did kind of the history of jazz drumming, no one would care. You know, yeah. you, you needed that kind of story arc. thing in there. Yeah. I, I remember I saw some reviews. Some, I think it was Entertainment Tonight, or somebody said, so apparently jazz is as hard to play as it is to listen to. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, oh, great. You That's see, the thing is, heavy metal, speed metal is more like yeah. sport drumming. You yes. Know. And that, you and know, that Fred, Ar- Fred Armisen, the uh, the comedian who also plays a little bit of drums and guitar. and you talking the, about the video? The, he's, uh, he's the house. Well, he he does have this interesting uh, faux <laughs> education. Caribbean or, or Polynesian nightmare. Is that what it's called? Uh, the, no, uh, he he did. He created. This, he's, he's making fun of Portnoy there. He's making. Totally. Yeah. He, he did an interview and, he, and they asked him two kinds of music you don't like. And he said. Jazz and classical. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> I mean, but you know, he's he, you know he, he's he's not hurting for exposure and for a musical career or a comedy Flam, career. Tap. Yeah. <laughs> Flam tap. <laughs> um, so, uh, what's uh, what's next for you? Look into the future. Where can people find you? You're playing at Rudy's Jazz around town. You're teaching yeah. at the University of North Florida. North Florida and Gary gigs. Um, you know, not that many public ones, but it's just fun to be part of it. You can go to his website, Gary Sinise Foundation. You know, he makes videos of almost everything we do just for promotion, and it's just see astounding to watch. So that's really yeah. Uh, check out and see if Gary's on. I yeah, think we'll I might be on following Instagram. him on on Instagram. Yeah. Hey, so somebody told me about a new platform that's coming out that's out that we need to jump on. It's called TikTok. Oh yeah, should I get on it? My kids. Are yes. On. What is it? So apparently, it's the next Instagram. <laughs> Gary Vaynerchuk says it's the next Instagram. Oh, uh, he's he's all over it. He's he's uh, grown beyond Snapchat. But what what is uh, what's the platform? You have longer videos or shorter videos, or what's the idea behind it? It's that almost like um, what was the name of that app? TikTok was known as Musically. Yes. Music Lee dot Lee or something like that. And so they changed it. Uh, but you know, oh man, what was the name of that one app where you could make five second videos? Um. You yeah. know what you want to talk about. Totally. Same thing. Just a different, you know, they, they it, it was basically the RC Cola, Pepsi, and Coke of the same. Well, I'm going I'm to just go, just in case, I'm going to get on it. Great. I, I'm already on when it. I, when, I, when I see these new technologies, I say to myself, hey, they're not going away. You might as well embrace it and get on that sucker. I mean, personally, guys, I got a YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Rich Redmond. There's about 450 videos on there, performances, behind the scenes things, lessons. And I think I have like 7,500 followers. Where are you people? This is free stuff. Come on, <laughs> check it out. Subscribe to the page. Um, so this terribly exciting i'm just it was just so nice to have this conversation rich great and if people yeah, want to find you can they email you danny yes, got danny at got at aol or university of north florida it's it's d gotley without the b d g o t t l i e at unf dot edu or you can go to gary's website and you know we're just around you know yeah. we're nashville based we've got maybe 10 more gary gigs i'm back and forth to florida all the time teaching and whatever comes along there's a um, you know, a couple of projects. Mark Egan and I have a, a duo project we're about to release, and what else? Uh, did Mark Egan play bass on What If God Was One of Us? Yes, he did. And you know who played drums? Our friend Sammy Marandino. Do you know yes. Sarah? Yes, sure. Uh, Sammy? I um, always wanted to go see that. Uh, uh, the Kinky Cin- Boots. Kinky Boots, yeah. It was so funny. I got to go see the rehearsals of that coming together, <laughs> and Cindy Lauper yelled at me. She's like, Hey, who are you over there? You're, get out of Sammy's hair. He needs to concentrate right now. Are you kidding me? No, it was great. I got to meet Sandy Lauper. She's great because I and that's how I, you know, I fell in love with Sandy. Sandy Gennaro's playing because yes. I got to watch him on MTV every oh, morning. Fantastic! And now we're all friends. Yeah. Hey, and in parting, if somebody said, "All right, I want to look up this Danny character. What is your favorite Pat Metheny recording? Favorite elements recording?" Mm, any of them, really. Yeah. You know, the first one, Pat Metheny group, people seem to like. You know, I was a kid. Early twenties, you were out a kid, of school, you know, and it was just fun to do. You were in your twenties. That's yeah, amazing. Twenty, yeah, it ended when I was twenty nine. So that was wow. 
Uh, but you know, for me, I love the Matheny stuff. I also love I, I there was a musically changing experience. Mark Egan and I both got to play with Gil Evans. Yes. Gil Evans wrote for Miles Davis. He was a famous arranger. And later in life he had this crazy big band that was a you know how usually when you play in a big band, someone says, Okay, you're gonna solo and you're gonna solo. This was play a, the, the, the melody to a song mostly in unison or from a, a loose arrangement and then anything can happen yes anybody can solo anybody can stand up anybody can change the chords Hiram Bullock may he rest in peace someone else I went to school with who Wonderful. was the original guitar player on Letterman he used to play somehow in every song we'd end up playing Purple Haze I don't know how that would happen <laughs> but there's a bunch of videos of the Gil Evans Orchestra I'm, I'm in some of them yeah but I, there was a, we did one concert with Sting we got to, in fact we got to play the synchronicity stuff in fact Mark and I spent hours listening to you know to Stuart Copeland and I was going to copy everything mm-hmm. and as soon as Sting heard one lick that sounded he said I don't want to hear that do, do something new don't so do the so Stuart so stuff. It went, don't out, replicate. it went out the window. It's like I worked on all this stuff. Oh, yeah. right. Well, it made you a better drummer. Yeah. Oh, oh, so much I tell fun. kids all the time, like, well, I don't chart, so what do I have to chart? I got a great memory. It's like, look at the charting <laughs> is going to help you learn the song, and you're going to be able to steal licks, and they're going to become part of your vocabulary. Yeah. You know, and that's the edge that you're giving your students. Who was the teaching assistant that was there when I did? I did a clinic there maybe four or five years ago. North Florida? In North Florida, you couldn't be there. You were on the road. Oh, oh, that's right. You were you had a you were teaching was it, assistant. Was it Dave, uh, um, David Smith, Jack Miller, one of the kids. One of the kids, and then also. Oh, oh, we had the drum heads. I remember we had to get the heads for yeah, you. Yeah, and then and, Tom Hurst was getting his masters yes. there at the time. Oh, yeah. he may have been getting his. Was he getting his doctorate? No, he masters. was. He went to UCF, the Central Florida one. Oh, I think, okay. I think that's maybe I'm went. thinking of a different school. I'm, maybe I'm getting but my you, Florida's. No, I forgot you did come to the school, and I wasn't there, and we had somebody help you. Yeah, and they loved it. Oh, you know. Tom Hurst went to another school. It was yeah, another yeah, school yeah. in Florida. Um, man, what a! And I'm going to put together my Danny playlist on spot Spotify. Every time <laughs> oh, yeah. I need a drummer, you know, what we do we could put a little put little Spotify playlist together, and we could put them in the show notes. Yeah, it's fantastic. Sure. Well, we've had so much fun today, and guys, these episodes come to you for free because of our sponsors, and of course, uh, big lighting. Big, big, big dot, dot lighting. lighting and electrical. Big dot lighting dot com. It's Jim's company. Hey, everyone's going LED. All the lights in the studio are LED. You got to, you know, get on the train there. It's going to save you money in the long run. So check out big dot lighting dot com. Guys, we appreciate you joining us here. Be sure to rate, review, subscribe, share, tell your friends. This has been episode seven of the Rich Redmond Show. Danny, thank you so much for being here. Pleasure. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Keep in touch with Danny. We're going to do this again. Bye, guys. Have a great day. This has been the Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts.